Well, hey there. Uh, we got a few more minutes till you guys get to experience Genesis, so uh, gonna need something for you guys to do. Hey, Ralph. Yo. The vision of this film, what are you hoping to accomplish? We're trying to show that the Bible is true, but also the science to yes. back it up. If we're gonna have a debate about science, can you please just be honest about it? Ologia presents The Science of Genesis, Paradise Lost. Part one, before the beginning. Welcome to Apologia and my series exploring the science presented in the motion picture Genesis Paradise Lost from Creation Today. Producer Eric Hovind and director Ralph Streen spend over five years on the project, which intercuts 3D animated narrative segments with a number of speakers, including Ken Ham, Bodie Hodge, Georgia Purdom, and Ray Comfort. If you've seen the film, you know that while the animation can be lingering and immersive, it left not much screen time to dig deep into the science. Many topics were introduced briefly, but seconds later it was on to the next topic, almost in a gallop. With five years of time, care, attention, and effort poured into the project, I think we owe it to the creators to unpack Genesis Paradise Lost, giving every topic, thought, and argument its due care and attention. It can't be tackled in one video, it's going to take a series. But I think we agree, the best place to start is in the beginning. The movie opens with a black screen, with music that is light, epic, and ominous all at once. As the camera moves slowly around a fully virtual candlelit room, cluttered with beakers, books, maps, props, and a T-Rex skeleton, reminding me of the giant dinosaur that used to adorn the Batcave. We will return to this room often, as it serves as the film's narrative hub. But after the numerous company credits, we are whisked into a three-dimensional map of how the creators imagined that a pre-flood world might have been configured. I would say this opening feels inspired by the famous Game of Thrones title sequence, but I'm sure the Genesis team avoids any such unedifying television. This series isn't a review of the film, but rather an exploration of the science skimmed upon within. As such, I won't be delving much into the creative choices, artistic merit, or general entertainment value of the experience but I'd be remiss to not acknowledge the dominating vocal performance of narrator Vodi Bauckham, a theologian who previously visited the Creation Today show. His gentle yet booming voice has been praised as the highlight of this movie by many, and I'd have to agree. God Dr. Vodi Bauckham is recording God. right now for the Genesis 3D movie, be fruitful the narration, and let me tell you, he's got a voice for narration. Leveraging the 3D gimmick this film was fundraised on the back of, the camera swoops through lush trees, mountains, waterfalls, snow, desert, ocean, into space where the earth is recognizable but the single continent is not, and finally coming to rest on the carcass of a dead animal and two pieces of simple clothing hanging out to dry on a vine, signaling to the audience that death and shame already exist in this sequence, neither of which existed in the movie's narrative until after Eve ate the forbidden fruit. The point is driven home with the picture's subtitle, Paradise Lost. The film's first interview segment doesn't make any scientific claims, but rather frames the argument that it will be making. You see, this argument over God's existence or creation versus evolution is not so much a religious argument. Genesis Paradise Lost is less a positive affirmation of young earth creationism and more an anti-evolution production. This positioning was hammered home in the marketing trailers. For over 150 years, one convincing lie has prevented billions from knowing the truth. While questioning biological evolution is a valid tack to take, many Christians took exception, claiming the movie makes a false dichotomy, a situation in which two alternative points of view are presented as the only options where others are available. In this case, millions of professing Christians around the world accept both evolution and the salvation message of Jesus Christ. A prominent Christian science organization, BioLogos, said that what Genesis Paradise Lost displays is something beyond disagreement, a refusal to acknowledge that any other Christian positions even exist. And, if so many thoughtful, faithful Christians have accepted mainstream science without abandoning their faith, is it possible that Genesis Paradise Lost has drawn the battle lines of the origin debate in the wrong place? I leave that question to the viewer. The film participants then gave an appeal to the authority of the Bible. It really becomes an issue of authority. Who is the authority? Is it God and his word, or is it man? That said, any argument from authority, or argumentum ad vericundium, 
tends to be rejected in the scientific community. In his book, The Demon Haunted World, Carl Sagan wrote, One of the great commandments of science is mistrust arguments from authority. Authorities must prove their contentions like everybody else. As this series will endeavor to look at the pure science of the movie in the way that a modern scientist might, we will temporarily set aside any appeals to authority and look at the evidence in isolation as best we can. In the next section, the speakers talk about the consequences of evolution being true. Evolution has a lot of unintended consequences that I'm not sure everyone's thought about. They relate to ethics, they relate to whether or not the world's supposed to be good. While it might be interesting to do a series about those consequences, this series is focusing on the science part. Ultimately, the consequences of something being true don't affect whether or not it is true. The score in a game can be true, even if that means a team is eliminated from the competition. The clock on the wall can correctly be reporting the time, even if that means it's time for a fun activity to be over. A disease diagnosis can be true, even if it has dire consequences to the patient. The consequences of a fact are irrelevant to the fact, so we won't address that discussion here. But at last, we're into the first section of information we can examine. There are thousands of PhD scientists all over the world who don't accept evolution, and many of them don't accept the millions of years. While this is a minor appeal to authority, I was curious if the number of PhD scientists who don't accept evolution could be verified if we could verify Dr. Mortensen and the others on the things they said. Since there aren't official statistics or surveys about the opinions of the global community of scientists, it's difficult to verify if indeed there are thousands of PhD scientists who don't accept evolution. The most prominent declaration of such scientists is the Discovery Institute statement titled A Scientific Descent from Darwinism, which since 2001 has gathered signatures of over 700 individuals from around the world with a PhD or MD in a natural science, engineering, computer science, or medicine. There are disputes about the credentials of some of the names, but I think we can take the list at face value. 700 isn't quite thousands, but it's in the ballpark. This statement is obviously meant to be an appeal to authority, an indication that a substantial number of educated people don't accept naturalistic evolution of life, putting doubters in the audience in reasonable company. An auditorium of 700 doubters sounds substantial, but how does that stack up against the number of evolution affirmers? There aren't reliable global statistics across all disciplines, so let's compare against the most relevant group of all. 105 of the dissent signatures are Americans with a PhD in biology. At the time of the initial survey, there were 153,000 active biology PhDs in the U.S., which means that only 0.07% of eligible biology PhDs vocally dissent to evolution. Inversely, 99.93% of biology PhDs tacitly affirm evolution. Of course, science is not determined by popular vote, but solely on its ability to make unique predictions that turn out to be correct. The speakers in the film are a mix of relatively self-taught lay people to some with doctorate-level education. The film showed restraint in touting the credentials of any individual participant, with one strange exception, Dr. Charles Jackson. I do have four degrees. Most evolutionists I've met have only three. I'm reminded of another recent movie. Banner's powerful and useful too. Is he though? Okay, how many PhDs does Hulk have? Zero. How many PhDs does Banner have? Seven. Here, take your wheel. No, I don't know how to fly one of these. Now you're a scientist. Use one of your PhDs. None of them are for flying alien spaceships! While higher education of any kind deserves the utmost respect, it goes without saying that the number of degrees an individual has doesn't say anything about the fullness of their knowledge nor the correctness of their opinion. Degrees definitely do not impart expertise in all areas, as Bruce Banner attests. While Genesis Paradise Lost has a PhD geophysicist, geneticist, microbiologist, and astronomer, Charles Jackson's highest degree is not even a PhD, but rather an EDD, a degree for education, not for science. Unlike others in the movie, Charles is not a working scientist, but a schoolteacher. My name is Dr. Charles Jackson, and I'm at a small Christian college in Moore, Oklahoma, teaching science here full-time. I also teach online classes for Liberty University. I mention this only because Dr. Jackson uses the count of his mid-level education degrees to try to elevate himself above biologists who typically have a bachelor, master's, and PhD all in the relevant field of biology. And, of course, credentials alone have no bearing on the veracity of claims made or research done. But Dr. Jackson goes on to say this. 
There is a small movement in the evolutionist community to try to get the doctoral degrees rescinded from all professing creationists. That is a bold and serious claim. When I was unable to find anything about this degree revoking movement, I reached out to Dr. Jackson himself to help point me in the right direction. Jackson generously replied, but admitted, I really don't know where that is in print. Maybe it's not. Jackson instead pointed me to a 2007 New York Times article with quotations by evolutionists as to why creationists should never be allowed to enter science degree programs, including Dr. Michael Deany from Texas Tech University, who Jackson quoted as saying, creationists should not be allowed to become scientists. However, in the article itself, Dr. Deany actually said, scientists do not base their acceptance or rejection of theories on religion, and someone who does should not be able to become a scientist. He merely criticized anyone who would accept or reject ideas based on any kind of religious bias. Somewhat disturbed by Jackson's willingness to misquote someone in order to make his point, I was still anxious to learn more about this degree rescinding movement, so I asked him again to further clarify what he meant. Jackson replied, This is the most solid thing that I can remember related to that. It was just a ripple through the creationist community that some of the evolutionists were thinking that something should be done about us and that this would be a good idea. A whispered rumor that unspecified people were perhaps thinking that some action might be a good idea is quite different from stepping into a wide-release movie and declaring unequivocally that a movement exists. The fact that someone's trying speaks of the nature of the debate. So was it a fact? Or was it something that Dr. Jackson heard that he exaggerated for the cameras? Despite being the least qualified scientist in the film, Jackson has the most screen time and will be making the boldest claims. Will we be able to trust his statements on big items when he isn't fully truthful in the little items? I think there's a verse about that. Of course, in a late night interview, it might be easy to slip. The accuracy of what makes it on the big screen is ultimately the responsibility of writer Tim Gwynn, director Ralph Streen, and producer Eric Hovind. How did such a statement get past Eric's team's fact-checking process? Was there a fact-checking process at all to ensure that what his friends were saying was as accurate as possible? Evolution is not scientific fact. The millions of years is not scientific fact. Evolution and millions of years is the greatest myth ever forced on the minds of men. The reason that everybody believes it is because they've been brainwashed. To make a blanket statement assigning cause to literally everybody is a bit dangerous. All one would have to do to falsify such a claim would be to find a single individual who grew up and was educated believing that evolution was false, who then looked at the evidence on their own and changed their mind that evolution was true. That individual doesn't believe because of brainwashing. Such an individual might even start a YouTube channel. It might be equally easy for someone to say the only reason that anyone doubts evolution is because they've been brainwashed and maybe point to children repeating were you there mantras and Sunday schools and homeschooling and use words like indoctrination and it would be an equally ill-advised generalization to make. If we are to investigate clearly and honestly, let's not assume motive. Let's not assume that our current interpretations and understandings are necessarily fully correct. And... Let's not assume a conclusion. As we go through the science of Genesis Paradise Lost, let's assume that we all want the same thing. To know the truth that conforms closest to reality, whatever that truth may be. Next on the Science of Genesis Paradise Lost. Part 2. Let There Be Land.